The Earth System, a video series for educational institutions for free use presented by the German Geological Society, the DGGV. Hello everyone, I welcome the viewers of another episode of my video series on the Earth System. In this video I would like to look at the plate movements on Earth in a large global context. We know that at diverging plate boundaries, two plates move away from each other because new oceanic crust is formed at the mid-oceanic ridge along the plate boundary. And at convergent plate boundaries, two plates move towards each other, with one plate subducting beneath the other. That means it is returned into the Earth's mantle. These movements are relative. That means they relate to the plate boundary being considered. But looking at the global context, how can we say which plate is actually moving where? Let's have a look, for example, at the South American plate here in this figure. At the Western plate boundary, the Nazca plate is subducted beneath the South American plate. But the question is, which plate moves where? Is it the Nazca plate that is moving east? Based on the arrows shown here, we could assume that. But it could just as well be that the South American plate is moving westward. The result, namely that the Nazca plate is abducted beneath the South American plate, is the same. Therefore, we have to answer the question how the plates move in a global context. To be able to say that, we need a reference frame. In the physical sense, a movement can only be defined with reference to another point or object. The arrows, and also the double arrows in this figure, show the relative movement of the plates among themselves. This means the movement between two adjacent plates. The reference system in this view is one of the two plates. In the case of a subduction zone, like here, looking at the example of the west coast of South America, this is a simple arrow that shows the velocity at which the respective plate is moving. In this case, the Nazca plate. And this arrow is valid exactly at the place where it is shown. To put it simply, when I stand on the west coast of South America, for instance near Antofagasta in northern Chile, the Nazca plate is moving towards me at 8 cm per year. And that is exactly the case at this place, a little above, which is roughly in front of Ecuador, for instance. There is another velocity marked in the arrow on uh, the Nazca plate. Here it only shows a velocity of 7 cm per year. As you can see, the velocities of plate movement change along the plate boundary. I had already discussed this relation in Chapter 4.3, which dealt with plate movements and rotations on the globe. We can describe every plate movement on the globe as a rotation of this plate, and accordingly we have movement velocities that become slower towards the rotation pole we find the maximum velocity at the rotation equator. I recommend that you just listen again to chapter 4.3 of this video series. But how can we actually measure the movement velocity of lithospheric plates in a global context? First of all, there are the magnetic stripe patterns that, that I explained in chapter 3.8. The wider the stripes, the more oceanic crust has been produced at the mid-oceanic ridge and the faster the plates are moving away from each other. And finally, the edge structure of the oceanic crust can be read from these magnetic stripe patterns. Here in this overview map we see the edge uh, structure of the oceanic crust and from this we can already roughly calculate how fast the plates have moved. Let's take the East Pacific rise as an example. Here, the strip with crust that is up to 20 million years old is quite wide. This is the red stripe in the middle of the active mid-oceanic spreading center. Here in the area of the equator, a strip approximately 3,000 kilometers wide has formed over the last 20 million years. This corresponds to an increase of 15 centimeters per year, that is 7.5 centimeter on each side. We can determine this using a simple rule of three calculation. For the East Pacific rise applies 3,000 kilometers 
correspond to 20 million years. And we want to know how many centimeters that is in one year. One centimeter equals x years. 3,000 kilometers, that is 300 million centimeters. And now I just have to divide the 300 million by the 20 million, and the result is 15 centimeters per year. This is, this is exactly the amount given for the East Pacific rise at its rotation equator. Further north and further south, the velocity of movement decreases with increasing distance from the rotational equator, as I explained already in Chapter 4.3 of this video series on rotations and plate movements. The same red stripe at the spreading center of the Atlantic, however, is much narrower. For the Mid-Atlantic Ridge applies 500 kilometers, correspond to 20 million years. And then you have to do the calculation again in the same way. As a result, I get 2.5 centimeters here, and uh, which again corresponds to the information for the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Okay, this gives us a way to determine relative plate movements. That is always the movement between two adjacent plates relative to each other. But what about in a global context? if we look at all the plates at the same time. To do this, we need a reference system that is independent of plate boundaries and applies equally to all plates. What is useful for this? Well, hotspots. Hotspots are places where hot mantle rock rises from great depth and collects in diapere head below the uh, lithosphere. From there, magmas can then penetrate upwards into the crust and form magma chambers. These in turn then feed volcanoes on the Earth's surface. And if the hotspot pushes up beneath an ocean, volcanic islands can form above the magma chamber over time. Things are a little different on the continental crust where huge volcanic systems often form, such as the Yellowstone hotspot as evidenced by the Yellowstone caldera today. Hotspots are considered stationary. That means, unlike lithospheric plates, they do not change their position in relation to the Earth's body as a whole. In the animation, you can see how the lithospheric plate moves over the hotspot. A chain of volcanoes forms where the volcanoes rise. The volcanoes only form directly above the hotspot, and when the plate containing the volcano moves away, from the hotspot area, it takes the volcano with it, which then goes out and leaves a chain of volcanic islands on the Earth's surface. In some cases, such hotspot volcanoes have extracted so much material in a very short period of time that it becomes a so-called flood basalt or large igneous province. These are the LIPs. LIP stands for large igneous province. I will look at the topic of flood basalts in more detail in a later video. Um, the classic example of a volcanic chain uh, formed over a hotspot is, of course, the Hawaiian island chain. In this short animation, you can see how the island chain has developed over the last two million years. The volcanoes uh, always form above the hotspot in several places here and there, but in principle always more or less above the center of the hotspot. And as the plates move, the volcanic islands formed above the hotspot are gradually transported out of the hotspot zone so that the volcanoes then become inactive. Today, Hawaii's volcanoes are on Big Island. This is Kilauea, which is currently one of the most active volcanoes on Earth, but also Mauna Loa, which last erupted in 1984, and Hualalai, which erupted several times in the 18th century. And off the southern coast, in less than 1,000 meters of water depth, there is an active volcano, Loihi, which may manage to rise to the sea surface in a few thousand years. The volcano chain of Hawaii clearly reflects the plate movement of the, plate of the Pacific plate across the hotspot. The plate moves from the youngest still active volcano towards the oldest volcano visible here and now long extinct. However, the chain of volcanoes does not end with the Neca Island at the top left of uh, this map. 
The volcanic chain is significantly longer and extends through the entire North Pacific to the subduction zone of Kamchatka, where the seamounts have been found to be more than 80 million years old. And we see there is a kink in the volcanic chain, where the Hawaiian island chain merges into the Emperor Seamount chain. From this volcanic chain, we cannot only see the direction of plate movement, but it is also possible to determine the plate motion velocity across the hot spot. And that is the absolute plate motion direction and velocity in the so-called hotspot reference frame. From the active volcanoes on Big Island to the Daikakuchi Seamount, we have a distance of more or less 3,500 kilometers. The Daikakuchi Seamount was at the position where Big Island is today, about 43, 43 million years ago. So we can say that the plate has traveled 3,500 kilometers in 43 million years. So another simple rule of uh, three calculation allows us to determine the average velocity of the Pacific plate during this period, which is 8.14 centimeters per year. We have a whole series of such volcanic chains on Earth from which you can determine the absolute plate movements. On the Pacific Plate, for instance, it is noticeable that the volcanic chains emanating from the McDonald Seamounts or the Pitcairn Islands have exactly the same kink as the Hawaii Emperor chain. This is because they lie on the same plane, namely the Pacific plane, Plate, and they represent a change in a plate um, a motion direction. I'll take a closer look at these kinks in the next video. In summary, we can assign absolute uh, directions and velocities of plate motion to the individual plates as shown here in this figure. And the relative movements that we see here in this illustration can also be calculated from the absolute velocities. Well, this is enough for the moment for the relative and absolute plate movements, but there is more information on this topic in the next video. This time Thank you for listening and I'll be happy if you stick around. I recommend continuing with the second part of the video on absolute and relative plate motions, which discusses the differences in the linear structures of volcanic chains and transform faults.